RDocs is located on the Business Center. You have a direct link to RDocs under number two, RDocs and Forms. And the very first option there is your RDocs login. So go ahead and click on that to access RDocs. If you have never been in the system before, you will be prompted to log in a second time. And you just use your same uh, Business Center login and password, which is your email address for your username and the password is uh, whatever you have changed it to if you have. Um, and then you're going to see the RDocs dashboard. Now, a couple of items about my dashboard. I have created tiles. So these little square things down on the page are tiles. And I have already created several of them, so you see them on my dashboard. But I want to direct your attention to the top part of the dashboard. So you're going to see your name and your contact information, and that will be whatever is entered into the into the database for the company. So if you change offices, typically um, I, I do manage to get those flipped, but if I don't, just send me an email and I'll get that changed for you. And secondly, you're going to have a select drop-down menu here. When you click on that, it's going to expose some options. So you do have the ability to make your own checklist to use on your tiles, and this will give you to-do items. Um, I'm not going to cover that in this webinar. There is a separate webinar for checklists, so you can look that up on the uh, Business Center under Professional Development if you're interested. Um, but here, the second option, Print Queue, is important to you. If you print multiple forms, so if you print, say, an entire listing package or a contract and um, an agency disclosure, you will be prompted to give them a name, and then nothing will happen, and you'll think it doesn't work. The system sends all of those forms that you have commanded it to print to the print queue, and you will download them from the print queue and print them from there. So just remember, if you're going to print multiple forms, go to the print queue to retrieve them. The forms library is exactly what it says. It is a library of all of the forms that the company has. That's over 270 forms. They are so sorted and put together in packages. And we'll look at that more closely when we get into building a tile. But this is your reference library. This is not where you go to create forms for your clients, but you can retrieve and download a blank form if you wish. There's also a help section here, and right now this contains help guides. So these are documents that you can download and either look at online or print them, and they will walk you through directions. So there is a user guide and some other things there. Eventually this will also have videos. Now, each of these, um, each of your dashboards has the ability to create a new opportunity or transaction. You can also search for any tiles that you have already created. Click in the box and type the last name of the client on the tile or the street address, so the street name. And then click the magnifying glass to sort and search for your tiles or a tile. If you have a lot of tiles on your dashboard, that's the most efficient way to find a tile quickly. You can also use these buttons and filter. Your default view is the active dashboard, so all active tiles. You can look at all of your tiles, so all of those active and inactive tiles. Or if you put an estimated closing date on a tile, you can search just by closings. You can also search by just buyer tiles or just seller tiles or access any tiles you have inactivated. The numbers here refer to pages. So you will see up to 15 tiles on your active dashboard. Once you go over 15 tiles on the active dashboard, the system automatically paginates them for you. So I have now gone to a third page of active tiles. This tells me that I need to go through and inactivate some of those tiles. Inactivation is what you do with a tile when it has closed 
or if a buyer can't buy or a seller can't buy or a seller can't sell. You do not delete a tile with that you have already established and you have created forms and entered documents on the tile and you have an e-sign history. You will not be able to or you should not delete those tiles. You can, unfortunately, but you should not. If you by mistake delete a tile that should just be made inactive, please contact me and I will have the vendor restore that to your dashboard. Now, each tile is client and transaction specific. So if your client is a buyer or a seller, they will have a buyer or seller tile. You cannot have buyers and sellers sharing the same tile except as a say a seller tile with buyer side trans uh, buyer side contacts. I'll show you what I mean about that when we construct a tile. But in the upper left hand corner, you will see the designation there according to what you have determined about that particular client. Client information will be entered at the top. Property information goes in the middle, and when you sync with the MLS, you'll see that it also pulls the main photo, and it will pull information from the MLS into your forms. You have an area for the forms necessary for the transaction, an area for documents that have been created, a contacts area, which will include your clients and any additional contacts that you add to the tile. At the top, you have a series of icons, and when you hover over any icon, it will tell you what it means. The first option here is a quick e-sign icon. That gives you the ability to start an e-sign session and upload an existing document to that session. So if you receive a counteroffer or an addendum or some other document that has already been signed by one party, you can upload that to an e-sign session. Right next to that is the e-sign history. This is where you can go to look at all of the details of your e-sign sessions. It will show the progress of the session. It gives you the ability to continue building a session if you didn't get finished with it. And it will give you the ability to go in and edit, save your client's email address and resend the invitation. On the other side of the line, there's an envelope that will enable you to send an email to your client. The plus sign is always the copy sign. This allows you the ability to copy any existing tile and reuse the, the contact or client information on that tile. The I is to inactivate the tile. And when you inactivate the tile, it simply goes to the inactive part of your dashboard. And the trash can is to delete the tile. Down at the bottom, you'll notice an email address. Each tile has an email address that is specific to that tile. Documents that are attached to an email and sent to this address will land in the documents area of your tile. So that's particularly helpful if you have a document that was emailed to you by, a, say, a co-op agent or your client, and you need to get it in your tile instead of downloading the attachment, saving it, and then uploading it to the tile, you can simply forward the email to the address on the front of the tile. Each tile is state stamped, so the date that it was created will show at the bottom. If you put an estimated closing date on the tile, that will also show at the bottom of the tile. Your tiles are arranged in chronological order, from the most recent in this upper left hand corner to the, uh, the most distant in terms of time at the lower right. You cannot alter this order. That's why if you are looking for a particular tile, you want to use the search box or any of the filter buttons to help you narrow down your selections. Let's go ahead and create a new tile so that you can see how to build one. I click on the blue button and the system will place a blank tile in that upper left corner of my dashboard. 
You'll notice that I don't have any client property information, forms, no, no documents, nothing has been done. And the tile appears gray. Buyer tiles are greenish in color, seller tiles are bluish in color. So you can see that down here. My first step is to click on plus client. And I'm going to be prompted now at the top to designate buyer or seller. So whichever this is, you just simply click on the button to darken it. Now, I click in the box and type a first name and a last name for the client. <clears throat> I can also search for any client that I have in my contact manager on the business center. This is a particularly helpful item because it will then pull any information that you entered for that particular client or contact from the contact manager. And that means you don't have to retype it here. It also links the RDocs tile to the contact in the contact manager so that once the tile is established, you will now have a live link to RDocs from that contacts summary page. So I am going to type in the last name of that contact and click search. It will now pull up any of these particular people, and if they're in my contact manager or in any instance of our docs, I can click on the checkbox and they will and it will enter their information here. So I don't have to type it. Particularly important is if you are going to use any email function in RDocs, and that includes electronic signature, you need to have an email address in the primary email box. You can add up to four email addresses and four phone numbers for a client, but one of them has to be clicked to be the primary. We have done that for you for the very first one. If you enter a second email, and change that email to the primary. Just make sure that you leave the first email in that box. When I've entered all the information, I click Submit. Now <clears throat> I will be shown the contacts area of my tile and I can see my first client here. Now I can click plus Add Contact to add a second contact. Notice that I have the buyer area already highlighted. I can search for an existing or I can enter the, the first name, last name, and the other information. The only required fields are the first name and the last name. However, you must add an email in the primary email box to use that client for, use that, uh, use electronic signature for that client. So I'm going to search for an existing, click on the checkbox, and that adds the client's information. Click Submit, and now they're in the list. I can add and edit any contacts by either clicking on Contacts on the front of the tile or the Buyer or Seller icon in the upper left-hand corner of the tile. That will take me into this area. Now, for each person entered in here, whether they're a client or some other contact, and by another contact, that could be anyone associated with the transaction. It could be your co-op agent, it could be your loan originator, your title representative, or in the case where you want to add buyers to an existing seller tile, it could be that buyer or uh, buyer or buyers. You'll simply click on Add Contact, but instead of a client buyer or a seller, now it's going to be a buyer side or a seller side person. You have to add at least a first name and a last name. I highly recommend that you add an email. That will make your life easier when you, when you want to email them documents. You can also select a description from the list. So these are um, general terms, so I've, you've got your buyer's agent, you've got your seller's agent, title rep, and different inspectors, home warranty, insurance agent, lender, but you also have your other side buyer and other side seller. 
and simply click Submit when you've entered that person. Now, for any of these contacts or clients added to your tile, you have a series of icons over to the right. If at any time you need to edit their information, change an email address, change a phone number, their, their street address, click on the pencil icon to edit the client information, and that opens the box up. Make any editing uh, that you need to and click Submit. You can also give your client access to the documents on their RDocs, on their tile. To do that, you're going to click on the envelope and send an email. This is a standard email. You don't have to construct it. It gives them a link into RDocs and login information. If you want to learn more about sharing documents, there is a webinar called Sharing Documents that, has, that is on the Business Center under 18 Professional Development in the RDoc section. But this is where you would go to email that login information to the client. And if you have done that, you can also give the client the ability to upload documents to their tile. I'm going to go back out to the dashboard to add my property, but just be aware that you do have internal navigation links. So within the tile, I can move from contacts to forms to documents. I can add or edit my property information. I can toggle to the same area in the next tile. So these arrow buttons let me go from one tile to another. I'm going to click either, you can click either here at the top or down here where it says return to dashboard and go out to my dashboard so that you can see the process from the front of the tile. Now when you begin to work with a buyer, you may not have a property, but let's just assume that they do have a property already and I'm going to add that at this point. At some point, however, you are going to add your property to their tile. I click on plus property and that opens up an add property box. I can do one of two things. I can manually enter the address and certainly when you're starting with a listing and you're preparing listing documents, this is how you'll do it. You'll go ahead and add the address manually. But I can also sync with the MLS. This is particularly handy when you're writing contracts and um, you know, working with buyers and, and writing those contracts because this will sync information from the MLS with your forms. So I'm just going to enter an MLS number. Um, I'll pick that one for my list. Verify your MLS from the list and then click search. When the property pops up there. Of course, you want to verify that that's the property that you thought it was going to be. And then if it is, go ahead and click Submit. But before I navigate away from this box, I want to show you this field down at the bottom. To enter an estimated closing date for your transaction, you'll enter it here in this area. Now, you may not have that when they first pick out a property. So that might be something that you have to come back to later on. That's okay. You can access that property box at any time by clicking on the street address. And when I hover over that, it says View Edit Property. That opens up that box. I can enter the estimated closing date, click Submit, and then it will appear at the bottom of my tile. My next step is to add my forms. So I'm going to click on Forms or the number, doesn't matter, and I'm going to get a list of packages. These are the packages that we have put together for you. They contain all the documents that you might need for the transaction. You'll certainly want to use the package, even if you don't intend on using all the forms. It will just make your life easier in the long run. So you'll scroll through the list and pick the package that matches your affiliation. 
So because I'm in Columbus, I'm going to cl- pick the Columbus buyer package for my for my buyer client. But just be aware, we've got Dayton, we've got Cincinnati, we have Springfield, we have Midwestern Ohio, we've got some additional forms for those areas, we've got Kentucky forms. All I need to do is come over to the right and click on the plus sign to add all of the forms in that package to the tile. When the forms are added to the tile, they will appear on the left-hand side of the screen in a list. The list is arranged alphabetically by title of the form. And I can scroll through there and see them all. The very first form by default is the HER data sheet. Before I get into the data sheet, though, I want you to notice that we have a plus add library or form. If for some reason a form is not present in that package that I want or I need to use, when I click on that blue button, now I'm going to get a list of all the other forms in the, in the library. But I can filter them by clicking on this drop down list. And now, say I want to look at this reference package, when I click on that, it's going to filter the forms and show me only those forms in that package. If there are no forms in a package, that means that that package has been added to the tile. You can either select all of them by clicking on the box next to form name, or you can select them individually. You can also search by typing in the search box, and any portion of the word that you use, I started to type buyer, and there are no buyer forms in here, but let's try insurance. So I haven't even finished typing insurance, and there pops up the form name. So that's a great way to search for forms in a package. All I have to do after checking the box or boxes is click Add, and they will be added to the tile, again, inserted in alphabetical order. Now, the first form, as I mentioned, is the data sheet. And the data sheet contains all of the information that you have already added to the tile. So you'll notice property information shows up in here. Contact information for the for the listing broker and agent. Buyer broker information should be yours if this is a buyer tile like mine. I don't know who the sellers are, so there's nothing there. But now I'm going to see my buyer information according to what was entered on the tile. Notice I have a source drop down, and I can indicate the source of this particular uh, client. So if this was a past client, an open house, it was a lead from some uh, source, uh, auction, corporate services, you get the picture. So I can click and add them, add the source. That'll help me keep track of where these people come from. Then I have space to put in title company information, mortgage company, home warranty company, all of that information that corresponds to what is on the front of those manila folders that you often use for your transactions. When I come down to the bottom section or the bottom of that form, I see an offer area. The list price will be fed in from the, um, from the MLS as well as the list date. But I can now put in a purchase price. So if my clients are ready to make an offer, I can come in here and write in just the numbers. And if they're going to put on earnest money, I can type in just the numbers. To advance from area to area, I can use the tab key. Otherwise, I can just click in the field with my cursor. If you put an estimated closing date on the front of the tile, that will be added here. Any of these blue fields can be edited. So you can just click in the blue field and type. But one caution, any time that you have information that comes from the tile, either from the information that you add about your clients or from that MLS sync, if you type 
and edit it. Say I decide I want to put the the street number here. It wasn't in the MLS, but now it's been established. If I type that in here, and then even if I save it, when I go away from this form, it's going to go away because the information on the tile will overwrite any corrections made to property or client information in a form. So the key thing that you need to remember is that you edit in the uh, any edit client and property information on the tile. Any other information you can edit in a form. Now right above this box, so this is my edit box, it will show the form template that I'm working on. And right above it or below it, there are a series of icons. These are the same icons. They govern what happens in this box. They are your individual forms commands. The very first one here that looks like a video play is a little e-sign overview. It's just a short four minute video that walks you through the steps, help you with, with e-sign if you forget something. You can send this form to eSign. You can lock it and prevent any further changes. So if I lock a form, these blue fields go away. I can email the form to anyone. I can print it. I can download a Blake version of it. I can save it. And I can delete it from my tile. Does not delete the form from the system. It merely deletes it from the tile. So I pick save because I wanted to save the changes that I made here. Now to change to a different form, I simply click on the name of the form in the list. And you'll notice that it showed uh, yellow highlighting before the name when I hover over it. But when I have this form in my edit box, it changes to blue highlighting. So now you can see the information that came from the tile. The only thing I have to do here is add the date. So I simply click in the box and type. When I'm done, I click Save, and it's saved. It's as simple as that. Now, one button here that I did not mention is inactive for most of the forms in the library, but it is available for the appointment of agent team, the agency disclosure team, and the Columbus purchase contract. In the appointment of agent team and the agency disclosure team, when I click on that icon, it looks like a page, I have the ability to add team names to the form. So all I need to do is either click in the box and start typing my team name, or I can scroll through the list. I click on the name of the team and then click Add, and it adds all of the names in their place. If there are any discrepancies, simply click in the box and edit. These are updated approximately once a month, um, and sometimes there's a lag. For the Columbus Purchase Contract, that becomes a way to add standard contract clauses to the form. So when I click on the page icon now, it shows the contract clauses. I can scroll through them, check the box next to the clause I want to use, and click Add. Or I can search in the box by starting to type a word. And then when it, I found the clause, I can click Add. Those contract clauses will show up on page 11. When you have multiple page forms, you have navigation helps down at the bottom. So I can click on the drop down and go to page 11 very quickly. Now I can edit these clauses. So if I have spaces where I need to type in information, I can number them, I can add additional clauses. I can also navigate at the bottom from page to page using the arrow buttons.
Now, for your purchase contract, when you enter the purchase price on the data sheet, it will bring the purchase price into the contract and it will express it in both numeral and word format. So that's a big plus. You don't have to figure out how to say $70,000 in words. It will do it for you if you enter it on the data sheet. Once you have your forms um, edited and you've saved them and now you want to send them to your client to sign electronically, you can do that by either using the e-sign icon at the top or the bottom of the edit box for an individual form, but if you have multiple forms the client needs to sign, you're going to check the box next to the form name and then once you've checked all the boxes, You're going to go to where it says work with forms, either above the list or below the list, and click and click eSign for electronic signature. This is your multiple forms command list. So remember earlier when I talked about the print queue? If you're going to print these forms, multiple forms, you would click print here and it, it's going to probably prompt you to you want to leave the page. Yes, I want to do that. And I can click in the box here, give it a name, and then click print. Now I'm going to say, where do they print? But if I go to the print queue up here, I'm going to see the, the buyer docs print order. I will get a download button when those documents are ready. That will open them up and I can give the print command for my local printer. So I'm going to send these to eSign for my client to sign electronically. So I'm going to check the boxes again next to the form names and I'm going to click on the select drop down menu and I'm going to choose eSign. Now, if you work on an Apple product, whether it be a Mac computer, an iPad, or an iPhone, be sure that you go into, um, into the settings for Safari and allow pop-ups and allow cookies. Otherwise, you will not be able to use eSign on an Apple product. It works just fine once you allow pop-ups and allow cookies. So I'm going to get my eSign setup box here in a couple seconds, and I'm going to start the process of setting up the eSign session. The session is made up of six steps. In the first step, your only requirement is to give it a title, and this becomes the subject line of the email that your client gets. So you want to be sure to go ahead and give it a name that they're going to understand. And it, by the way, if you use a password for your session, don't put the password in the subject line. That kind of defeats the purpose of a password. So my session title, I might say documents to sign. You know, if it's a contract, I might put the, con the, the property address, whatever it might be. That's actually my only requirement of this step. However, there are a few things you need to understand and maybe you want to change. You can add an email message if you so choose. They will get instructions in the email that is sent to them. You can CC anyone. This will send the signed documents immediately to the address that you indicate in the CC email box. You will not be able to add an email message to that. It will simply send the, uh, the, the email with a link to the documents. Now, the link of the, uh, that comes in the signing completed email presents some problems if you, use inter if you use your Outlook web access. If you want to view the documents contained in that link, you need to use inter Internet Explorer or 
and I recommend you use this method. Go over to the right and check the box next to send CC email final documents as an attachment and then put your email address in the CC email box. What this will do is send you a, a second email, a second signing completed email with the documents attached as PDFs. The documents are always available to you on the tile, but if you want to work from your email, that gives you an alternative to having that link in the email. So for, for whatever name you put in there, whatever email address you put in there, checking this box will send the final documents as an attachment to that address. Now, over on the right, the signer sequencing. The default setting is to send to one signer at a time in order, and this is the preferred method. If you have two people sharing an email address, especially, it is important that you leave the default setting. This email that gets sent to both of those clients will have exactly the same subject line, and it will look like the same content to the email provider. We've had instances where email providers see that as spam and they block it in the future. So, you know, you can send to two people at the same address, but just leave that default setting checked. To send to all signers at once, that's a great option if you've got people in different parts of the country. And instead of waiting for the first signer to get up in California before this and sign their documents before the second signer can sign them uh, in, on the East Coast, it, it would, you know, they can just do it on their own time. The system will combine their signatures and send it to you completed with both signatures on the page, and it will send them each the signing completed. In fact, all of your clients get a signing completed email with the documents. So you will have uh, uh, fulfilled your obligation to send them their documents with the signatures. The default setting here is to include you as a signer. And if you don't need to sign anything, uncheck the box. You can also set up a session password that is optional. That would be for everyone in the session to use to get in to sign their documents. When this is set up the way you want it, click Next to advance to Step 2. You'll notice now I have a Previous button. I can go backwards and forwards in my session setup. I can also click on the numbers at the top. Uh, I would not recommend that you jump ahead, but rather, if you need to, go backwards. Now I'm going to see my clients, and then I'm also going to see the listing agent in here because I synced with the MLS, don't need them. So I'm going to delete that person by checking the box and clicking delete. It's always going to ask you to confirm. You'll notice now I've got the checkbox. I can move that person up, or I can move them down and change the order of signers. I can add signers if necessary. I can edit the signer by clicking on the pencil icon. So if I forgot a middle name, middle initial, or I need to send it to a different email address, I can do that here. There's also something called authentication. eSign uses the IP address of the device the client uses to sign on. But if you need and to authenticate the session, I should say. But if you need another level, another layer of authentication to satisfy an entity, um, go ahead and click on authentication to expose your options. KBA, the first one, knowledge-based authentication, is a separate service. We do not have anything to do with it. It costs $3 per signer, and it searches um, credit history, vehicle registration history, anything that's a public knowledge, to put together questions to ask the client before they can go in and sign their documents. If they don't answer the questions correctly, they won't be able to do it. 
if you have, um, um, you know, a bank perhaps who wants to have a, that kind of authentication, um, certainly go ahead and use it, but just be aware you have to do this for each person. You also have the ability to put an individual password on your on your um, uh, sorry an individual password for each client. KBA plus password links up those two things, and then you have SMS text, which is free, and it gives you the ability to set up um, a, a session where the client, regardless if they have a smartphone or not, would be able, would put in their, um, their mobile number and get a text um, they'll get a text with a code that they can then um, enter and, um, and get in to sign their session. So whether they have a smartphone or not, they can probably get a text message and that gives them that level of authentication. Now there is something called signing in person. So if you're at a, an appointment and need to have the person sign something um, and you want them to use your device and instead of having printed materials, you do it from your RDocs dashboard and you set up your session and they can go right in and sign, but they you will need to use a type of authentication. The most popular and the easiest to use is that SMS text. Now, when everything is the way you want it here, click Next to go to the next step. And this is important that you see this Designate Signers box. When you send forms to eSign, they are templates, and they have places for people to sign, but the system doesn't know who should sign where. So that's up to you to designate where somebody's going to sign. So Click on the drop-down menu and then click on the name for each person who's going to sign on that form. Click Apply Signers to all templates if you are using multiple templates, and that will repeat the order on all templates. If you have forms in your session that have places for, say, the seller to sign and you do not have the seller, you can leave those places blank you will get a warning when you click Next, saying that there are locations that have not been assigned a sign or do you want to continue? If you are sure, click Yes. If not, click Cancel and look at it again. But it is important that you have places on each form's template for a client to sign. Now I'll go into step three where I will see this, the forms that I have put in the session. I can check the box and move up or move down. Then I can change the order in which they sign the documents. I can edit the name of the document by clicking on the Edit Pencil. Click the arrow to confirm. I can add additional files by clicking on Add Files, and then I'm going to get this little box. If it is saved on my local computer, I'll click Local Disk. But if I want to, I can link eSign with Dropbox, Box, or OneDrive. And I can save documents to those cloud storage services and access them from any device. So for example, if I use an iPad and I need to upload something into an eSign session, I can send that to Dropbox and then go pick it out of Dropbox from this uh, box here by clicking on the Dropbox icon. I'm going to take a, a, um, a form or a document, I should say, from my local disk. I just click on it and then click open and it's going to add it to the to the list 
of documents here. And sometimes whatever that is that you uploaded has a funny name that your client might not recognize. I recommend you go in and edit it. Now that I have all my forms or my documents in here, I click Next. And now I have the ability to add signing locations, initial locations, all of these bubbles up here will give me uh, uh, additions. So uh, if I need to add anything, a form field allows the client to type on the form or the document. Checkbox is what it says it is. A radio button is the circle that when clicked on darkens. So if I scroll down here and look at the documents now, I can see where the system has placed signature and date fields for those clients on the form templates that I have added through from the forms area. But now I come to the document that I added to the session. And I need to put my client's initials and date. I simply click, drag, and drop. The important thing is that I verify the signer in the upper left corner. So there's the first signer, but now when I want to add the second signer's initials, I click on the drop down and click on their name. And now I can click, drag, and drop the second signer's initial and date fields. And then I continue to do that throughout the document. Click, drag, and drop. Now you notice I didn't verify the signer, so I gotta move that. One thing you need to be aware of is that you cannot overlap signature fields on top of one another. The system will be a bit confused and it may block it. But I made a mistake there and I put Woodrow Wilson's so I can click on the X and delete that. So if you do make a mistake, you can edit these by clicking on the X to delete it. They can all be moved around on the page anywhere that you need it. Now, on the right-hand side, you have markups available to you. You have the ability to add a text box or a strike-through line. A text box, you just click, drag, and drop. But this is a box that you can type in. You notice that the type font is blue to, to show that it is different from the document. The fields can be Adjusted. If I mean, hover over the edge, you'll get the arrows and you can click and drag it. You can rotate it to fit a space. And if you make a mistake, you can drag it or you can exit and delete it. The thing with markups that you need to understand is that once you move from step four, you cannot make changes to them. So any changes need to be done in step four before you navigate away from it. So I placed that strike through line where I wanted it to go. I have the same ability to change the length of the line by hovering over the edge and then clicking and dragging. I can also move it, rotate it, or delete it. When I click Next now, I am going to get a box that tells me markups have been added, which will modify the original document. This action cannot be undone. Are you sure you want to continue? If you've added markups, you may want to add initial locations for each signer. This is especially true if you are doing this on a contract. I'm going to click OK because I know everything's the way I want it. But now when I come into step five, I can preview all of the documents. And one thing I can do instead of scrolling, I can also click over here on pages and click to specific pages. 
in the document. And, and view them. If I need to make a change with signature or date or initial fields, for example, I forgot to add them on this page, I can go back by clicking Previous and go back to Step 4 and add or change any of these bubbles up here at the top on my document. When I move on from Step 5, however, I say everything's okay, and I go to step six, I've got another ability to add a, an email message if I so choose, but now I can edit that email message. So I can do any number of things to it by using the, the commands here. But when I click next, I'm actually sending that to the client for signature. I'm gonna click on the little X at the upper right corner to get out of this. Say I got called away and I couldn't finish my setup. I had to go do something else. Or I was at step three and I was waiting for the property disclosure to come through email so that I could download it, save it, and add it to my session. I can come back into my RDocs tile at any time and click on the eSign history. And then click. It shows me that it's building. That means the setup is not complete. I can click on the Actions button to continue the session. And it will take me into the eSign session setup where I left off. This is important because I see many, many agents starting multiple sessions for the same documents because they had to stop in the middle or they perceived there was a problem and they keep setting it up again and again. You don't need to do that. Go into the eSign history and continue this session. Now I can even go backwards in here and make any changes that I need to, except for those markups. Those can't be changed anymore. But now when I click Next, it's going to send the session to the client for signature. I'm going to see the session details. And if I look here, you'll notice the session details show me that this person has been invited. That means the email has been sent. And if I need to send it again, I can click the resend button. If I need to edit the e-signer, I can do that. I can edit their email address, click save, and then resend it. The session details gives me the entire log of everything that is done in that e in that e-sign session. Now, what happens when the documents are signed? They're going to be delivered to the tile and put in the documents area of the tile. So if I go into the documents area of a tile, I'm going to see all of the documents that have been added to that tile via eSign. Documents are added automatically via eSign, or if you send them to that email address on the front of the tile, or if you add them via a browser upload or via fax. If I have a document saved on my computer, I can come in and click via browser, and in the box, I give it a title, a name, either from the list or clicking in the box, choose my file, so navigate to where it is and click on it, and click Upload and Add. That will give me a new box or Upload and Close. You can upload any kind of document. It doesn't have to be a, a PDF. It could be a JPEG, it could be a GIF, it could be a document, a doc, Word doc, an Excel file, whatever. If I upload via fax, same idea, except now I'm going to create a fax cover sheet. When that fax cover sheet comes up, I'm going to print it, put it on top of the document, and then put it in the fax machine and send it to the number on the, on the cover sheet. They will land in your documents area. What can I do with documents? I can check the box, 
click on Work with Documents. I can choose Review. That will allow me the ability to see a document without having to download it. I'm going to skip over Ready for Review. You can email it to anyone. You can fax it. You can move it or copy it from one tile to another. You can print it. You can remove it from the tile, and you can rename it. Renaming is very helpful. If you have a document that comes in that has a funny name, like a scanner name, you can rename it and use one of the standard names in the list, or you can type in the box and, and give it your own name. All of the documents will be posted, so date and timestamp when they came into the tile. Each document has a document history. This logs anything that's done with that document, whether it's uploading it, emailing it out with the entire email history, so who it was sent to, the subject, and the email address, when it was sent, um, if the document was faxed out, any of those things um, will be logged in the document history. By definition, all of your documents are private and visible only to you. So if you're going to share them, you have to change the document privileges using this icon. If your document list is so long that you can't scroll through it or don't want to, you can click in the box, type the document name, and click the search magnifying glass and see just those documents that match your search. So just remember, with eSign, all of your documents show up here in the tile, and they can be emailed from here. If you add your co-op agent to the uh, tile, then their name will show up here as one of the contacts. And you can check that. You won't have to click in the box and enter their name or their email address. And you can put your subject, your message, and send it. It will send the documents attached to the email as a PDF. This concludes the webinar.